Spencer. I'm one of the teaching elders here, and this today is uh, the third in uh, a series that I have entitled Patterns. And before I always begin, I want to tell you from this particular scripture, God is in relentless pursuit of you. It doesn't matter where you are now. It doesn't matter where you were yesterday. God says, I want to take you out of where you are and into what I have for you. And believe me, he has much for us. And so... Um, the first uh, message in the series, and I'm going to do a very quick review because we have a lot to cover today, was called Out of and Into, uh, and it's based on the, the idea that um, that's most of us, including myself, when we find ourselves in a situation or in trouble, what we want God to do is get us out of it. Get me out of this. Solve this, God. Change this. Do something. And we're content with it to just go away. But God says, no, 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 no. You have to understand, I want to bring you out of where you are and into what I have for you. And so I use the passage from Numbers 27, and Moses spoke to the Lord saying, May the Lord... The God of the spirits of all flesh appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in that the congregation of the Lord may not be like a shepherd who has uh, sheep which have no shepherd. Out of and into. Um, and so when we bring that into the uh, New Testament era, uh, we're recognized that there is a transformation God has in store for us from 2 Corinthians, but we all with unveiled face beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as the Lord the Spirit. And God is transforming us into his son, Jesus Christ. And so he's brought us out of death and brings us into life. He's brought us out of darkness and into light. He's brought us out of fear into love. He's brought us out of slavery into freedom. He's brought us out of the old into the new. He's brought us out of sorrow into joy. Um, he's brought us out of unbelief into faith. And so we see this pattern that evolves. And God is in the business of transforming us into the image. And where you are today, God says, I am about to transform you and move you from this spot where you are at, out of it, and into something new. And we focused in the first message that he has brought us out of the law of sin and death and brought us into the law of the Spirit, that we now no longer are slaves to sin and death, but we have been set free, and we walk now, not by the flesh, but by the Spirit. The second message is called Taking Ground, and in that, I talked about uh, uh, the fact that sometimes when, when he took Israel, he took them out of Egypt, and where did he take them? Into the wilderness. I don't want to go into the wilderness. Well, that's a pattern. It's a pattern that God takes people. He took Paul from his conversion into the wilderness. He took David from being king into the wilderness. He took Moses when he was in Pharaoh's household. He took him out of there, and Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness. And so uh, God takes us into wilderness and this is why, and you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what's in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And the point was that sometimes when we are in the wilderness, we find out what's in our heart. We looked at 
how Israel responded. Israel responded with complaints, grumbling, accusations, rebellion, jealousy. And sometimes when we find ourselves in the wilderness, we find ourselves in anger and in bitterness. And God says, I wanted to show you what was in your heart. Now let's lay it down. I want to bring you out of that. And I want to bring you into something new. I want to bring you into something different. I want to bring you into a land that I have for you. Um, this is, I didn't use this psalm, but I ran across it uh, in my studies this week. And it's the Psalm 78. Oh, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. And again and again they tempted God and pained the Holy One of Israel. And they did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the adversary. And I think what's important about this particular scripture is that when we find ourselves in situations, in wilderness situations, we do not forget who has brought us and what he has bought for us. We are alive because of him. We are free because of him. And we sometimes just throw that away so quickly. And God says no. And I talked about when we are in those situations, there are certain foundational blocks that we need to remember. One of those that I talked about is God loves you. You need to focus on that. You need to remember that. God loves you. How could God love me? God loves you. He died for you. He poured out his blood for you. It is a foundational idea of a fact. God loves you. He redeemed you. Fact. He freed you from your sins. He's forgiven you your sins. And so we have, um, um, we have these things that we need to remind ourselves of when we are in that wilderness that um, uh, he has revealed himself He has, as we sang the song today, he's given us authority. He's given us authority over the enemy. How many times do we just bow down to the enemy? Let him roll over us. Oh, okay. No, we have authority. And God says, I want to take you out of a land of Egypt, and I want to bring you into a different land, a land that you're not ready for, a land that you don't understand, and I want to teach you about this new land. And in Deuteronomy, that's what he's getting to the point here. For the land in which, to, in which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt. It's not like the world here. It's a different place from which you came, where you used to sow your seed in the water and with your foot like a vegetable garden. But the land in which you are about to cross to possess it is a land of hills and valleys drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the year. And he brings us in, he wants to bring us into this new land, this new culture, this new way of life. For as many be the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, by him... Also, by him is our amen to the glory of God through us. We need to be able to take land, take ground, take spiritual ground. This is the land that I'm bringing into you, bringing you into. You're forgiven. You're loved. I'm showing myself to you. You've been redeemed. Walk in these things. I've given you authority. But... Joshua said, Then the whole congregation and the sons of Israel assembled themselves at Shiloh and set up a tenth of meeting there. And the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the sons of Israel seven tribes. This is Joshua 18. We're in the 18th chapter. Seven tribes who had not divided their inheritance. So Joshua said to the sons of Israel, How long will you put off entering to take possession of the land which the Lord The God of your fathers has given you. God has said, I've given you through the death and resurrection of my son so many things, so many promises. The promises are yes. Go in and take the land. What is taking you so long? 
And that was the second message. Whoo! Third message, and that's today. It's entitled, Near and Far. And it's based on Ephesians 2. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Do you remember that? You were lost. You were dead. You had no hope. But in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near. He has brought you out of death and he has brought you to himself. He has brought you into himself. And so today I want to focus a little bit on entering your promised land. Now, that's a little tricky because there are so many times that we are told to enter. Enter into this. We are told to enter into the kingdom. We're told that we have been brought into the household of God. We have been told that we have been brought into this age of grace. Um, we've been told that we are to enter through the narrow gate. And so I'm going to focus on three enters into today. And the first that I think of paramount importance is entering into his presence. Now there's a promise in... Um, nope, not going to go there. Okay. I cut that slide this morning. If you were a Jew in the time of Jesus Christ, there was the temple. And within the temple was a place that was called the Holy of Holies. And that's where God would dwell. And once a year, just once a year, the high priest would be able to enter into the Holy of Holies. But before he did, first he had to slay a young bull or a calf and take it in and sprinkle the blood on the altar in, in, uh, in the Holy of Holies. And that was for his own sins. And then he would come out. But let me tell you why I put this particular slide on there. Is you'll notice that the little bells that are there, and around the bottom of his, his uh, 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 priestly outfit uh, are pomegranates and bells. And so when he would go into the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around his leg, around his foot. And so when he was in there and doing what he was supposed to be doing, they could hear the bells jingling. Dingle, 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 dingle. If they didn't hear the bells dingling, they knew he was dead. They couldn't go in to get him, and they weren't about to go in to get him. So they had this rope, and they would pull him out. So once a year, he would go in, and it was called the Day of Atonement. And he would seek forgiveness for the entire Israeli community, the entire population, asking that their sins on this one day would be forgiven. And there were also two goats. I don't want to go, into, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far. But there were two goats. Uh, one of the goats uh, they would take in, and it would be a propitiation for their sins. And that goat would be slain and the blood sprinkled. The other goat they would lay their hands on and confess all of the sins that they, that Israel committed. I don't know how long that would take, but I bet a while. And then they would take that same goat, and they had a guy appointed, and he would take it out into the wilderness and let it go, and it was symbolic of all of their sins had been forgiven, and they were gone, and they were out in the wilderness. Well, Matthew 27 Jesus is hanging on the cross, 
and he breathes his last words, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And at that time, that veil that separated the Holy of Holies from everything else was torn in two. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, the veil itself was about 60 feet tall and about 20 feet wide. And there is no exact dimension as to how thick it was. Josephus, in his writings, says it was a hand's width thick. And by tradition, then, they have figured that it was probably about four inches thick. And this veil, when he dies, it is ripped in two, signifying that the way into the Holy of Holies is now open. That it's open for all. That we can come into the presence of God. And Hebrews reaffirms that passage in 1019. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, we've been forgiven. Your conscience has been cleared. This is new time. This is new ground. This is spiritual ground. Your body, you've been buried with him in baptism and you've been raised with him. You have access to him. Now this is, if you were here when Judah was teaching, he was teaching about the fear of the Lord. And I want to emphasize that when we enter in and we're willing to be into his presence, it's almost, it's a sort of a conundrum because, first of all, we have to understand that we are approaching the everlasting God, the creator of all things, the Holy One. When Isaiah sees him, he falls at his feet and says, I am unholy, I'm unclean. There are countless times in Scripture where people have been seen in the presence of, and they've dropped dead. And so Isaiah says, I, even I, the Lord, am the Lord. There is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed. There is no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Even from eternity, I am he. There is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? And we must have this foremost in our mind. He is God. He says it, and no one, and that's the reason Jesus says, no one can take you out of my hand. No one. And there's a block that we have to hang on to, even in the, midst of, in the midst of our wilderness. No one's going to snatch you from my hand, Jesus says. He's reaffirming here, I am God. If I speak it, it will be so. Now, 2 Corinthians, maybe, There we are. Second Corinthians gives us a great picture, 6, 16 to 18. And he's quoting. He says, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God is declaring that you are his people, and he is our God. Therefore, come out from the midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is in, unclean. And then he goes on to add something else. I will welcome you, 
and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. See, now he's moved it to a very personal, I will be a father, not to the people. I will be a father to you, Rusty. I will be a father to you, Michael. I am their God, and I will be a father to you. And a father is one that you can come into, you can talk with, you can reason, you, you can... You can, you can ask for advice who loves you and cares for you and wants only the best for you. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. And that's important. So not only do we see him as a father, but we see him also as a God, and we must stand in awe of him. And so what I'm trying to get across here is that when we enter into his presence, as Judah has said, we don't come in with, hey, dude, want to hang out? You remember, that's, I'm quoting him. It's not a casual it's not a casual, well, yeah, God and me are just hanging out. It is, he is God, and I respect him and stand in awe of him, but he's also my father, and it's very personal. And he says, I love you, and I care for you, and I want only the best for you. And come into my presence, and we will sit, and we will talk. And there's a scripture. Uh, I didn't put this up there. Uh, watch out. Here's, this is a rabbit hole. Uh, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says, uh, what does it say? Uh-oh. Though, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. And for years, I misinterpreted that. See, I thought, well, God, you want to know, you want to reason together, I'm going to give you my opinion on these things, you know? What would you like to know, God? I'm, I'm filled with my opinions. Let's reason together. Didn't mean that at all. When God says, let's reason together, he says, he's meaning, you pay attention to what I'm saying. That's that simple. Okay, sorry, rabbit hole. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and your right hand is pleasures evermore. See, when we begin to practice the presence of God, when we begin to walk in through that holy of holies covered by the blood, not only do we come in with awe, and not only do we come in with a relationship with God, but we come in and he says, I want to fill you with joy. Because in my presence, that's, there's joy. And it's very simple. In God's pursuit of you, he wants you to enter into a relationship with him. Now, sing for joy and be glad, O daughters of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. And then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that the Lord of host has sent me to you. And this is a prophecy of Jesus. I will dwell with you. I will be with you. And I will be not only as a God to you, but as a friend and a father. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance and incline your ear and come to me and listen that you may live. And so when we come into the presence, you know, if your prayers are like mine, I don't shut up. 
well, God, you got to fix this and you got to fix that. And well, this, this is bothering me, Lord. And you know, this problem. And you know, well, I got to pray for so and so and then, you know, this. And I never take time to listen. And he's reminding us you come to me and listen, give ear. Judah and I were talking about this the other day. Sometimes when we pray, we have our little list of prayers and we pray what we want. And we don't bother to ask God what he, what he has in mind. Okay. The second entering into is rest. It's important that we enter in to his presence. But he's encouraged us, us to enter into his rest. Now, rest is an interesting word. And if we go around here, we might say, what does rest mean to you? And rest means you ah, a couple of weeks at the beach, a little R&R there. That's rest. New definition. Or rest in peace. Yep, that's resting. Or your mother, the mothers in the household understand this one. Mm-hmm. Rest. Nap time for the kids. Yeah, let's, let's have a rest time, children. Sometimes when you're working, you just need a moment of rest. Never did get this one. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Next time you sing that at Christmas, just remember, you're being encouraged to rest. Sunday rest. But we have to understand that rest is not idleness. We're not to be idle before the Lord. Well, I'm just resting in the Lord. Resting, resting, resting. Well, no. Hebrews 4 tells us, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from him, from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience like they did in Israel when they were coming out and they were in the wilderness. See, if we're going to rest from our works, we have to understand that God has done it for us. The cross was all sufficient. If you're in this room or out there in TV land and you think you got to earn your salvation, your salvation has been bought for you. God will not love you any more. God will not love you any less. God has redeemed you, forgiven you, and you can rest in that. Rest in that. Therefore, let us fear. Now, that's an interesting question. Usually, when we see this in Scripture, we see fear not. But here we're saying, no, wait a minute, you better pay attention. Pay attention. While a promise remains of entering his rest, anyone should come short of it. And what is, re, what is being re-emphasized here is we need to be people who are at rest. Resting in him. Now he's talking about those who were in the wilderness. To whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. There are things that will prevent you from entering his rest. And one of those is unbelief and doubt, how quickly it, it surfaces. 
Did God say that? Yes, God said it. Well, I don't really believe it. It's not, I don't see it. It's not happening. And we enter into this unbelief. And that is what caused them not to enter the rest. Take care, brother, and lest anyone should be of, lest there be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart and falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. See, we have a charge to encourage one another, to encourage one another to rest in what God has promised, to encourage one another to take ground, to take spiritual ground, to encourage one another to understand that the promises of Jesus Christ are yes and amen in him that we may enter rest. For all who have believed have entered that rest. Well, here's my old friend. You remember him from week one? Sir Isaac Newton, and he has another really important thing to tell us. A body in motion stays in motion. A body at rest stays at rest. And I kind of get this picture of the person who is in motion. We gotta do this, we gotta do that, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. And they never come to rest. And there are rest stealers, there are rest thieves. And this is a pretty extensive line list, and I'm not gonna go over it in any sort of detail, but rest can be stolen from you. You forget his promises. You become impatient, dissatisfied, mistrust, fear, despondency, strife, anger, dissensions, anxiety, perplexity, suspicion, murmuring, complaining, failure to see and to hear, dull, hard heart, jealousy, disputes, doubt. They all steal rest from you. And if you're facing any of these rest thieves, lay them down. And enter into that rest. God, you have said, I'm going to take ground. And I think I'm going to move right on to the third. You want to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And see, there is a way into rest. And Jesus says, just all you have to do is come to me. Come to me and believe what I say and rest in that. And cease from your striving. Cease from your troubles. Cease. Enter into my rest. And the third thing that I think is important that we enter into, it's entering his with thanksgiving. Um, I found this on a slide, and I really liked it. Bow down before the Lord. Worship him, oh, worship him. Bow down before our God. Enter in, oh, enter in. Now, when we come back to this particular scripture in Psalm, Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generation. That's interesting when he says, Enter his gates and his courts. And I'm going to go right. This is a, this is a rabbit hole. Uh, there, this is a, uh, yeah, this is a rabbit hole. Uh, this is a picture of Herod, Herod's temple. And um, the actual, the highest point there in the center, that was where the Holy of Holies was. But the areas outside that, uh, the area along the left-hand side was called the Royal Palace, and that's where Herod lived. And then the big areas around the, uh, the temple itself was called the Court of the Gentiles. And to go into the um, into the temple area, there were thirteen gate or twelve gates. 
that you could enter in. Now, some of those sometimes were closed, but when it says, let us go and enter his gates with thanksgiving, it's trying to give you a picture that when you go into the temple, in through those gates, go in with thanksgiving. And then inside the gates were initially uh, the, the first area um, that you can see going in from my side into that. That was called the court of the women. And within that courtyard, there were four separate courts there. Uh, one of those was the treasury, and that's where Jesus saw the woman putting the mite in, in, the, um, in the offering. Um, and then within that, then there is the, called the court of Israel, and within the court of Israel, there is the court of priests. And so when the scripture says, let us enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, I want you hereafter to have this picture of coming into the temple and giving thanks for what he has done and then praise as I come in closer to him for who he is. Oh, well, I told you where the court of the Gentiles was, and there was uh, 12 gates that they could go in. And by each gate, there was this, uh, this plaque was over each gate. Um, and they've actually found two of them about uh, in the early 1800s, they uncovered these. And here's the translation. It says, no foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. So no, no Gentile can go in, no foreigner can go in. Whoever is caught on himself shall be put blame for the death which will ensue. In other words, if I'm a Gentile and I decide to go in through those gates, I'm basically saying I'm a dead man because they will, uh, that the guards there will kill me. No Gentiles were allowed in there, which is a great picture for us because we are Gentiles and we have been given access not only inside the gate, but into the Holy of Holies. Let us enter in. And now when we enter in, let's do it with thanksgiving. Let's do it with praise. Um, and if you want to read more about this in Acts 21... Good old Paul. Paul takes an Ephesian man, a Gentile, sneaks him in. And that's what causes the riot. They said, he brought, he brought a Gentile into the courts, into the temple area. And they were going to stone him because Paul was making a point. And when Paul runs in Ephesians, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. See, there was that wall that from the Gentiles court into the temple. And what he's saying is Jesus Christ broke that wall down. So we have access. Let us draw near. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips which give thanks in his name. See, again, this is another picture. There is no sacrifice needs to be made at this point. The only sacrifice that you need to be able to make to God is what? The fruit of your lips. Praising him, giving thanks. And so when we come in and in the, when we begin our service with, with singing with worshiping him, you are offering to God through your lips sacrifice, fruit of your lips, giving thanks to his name. Thus, says Psalm 63, I have beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life my lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Uh-oh. 
Look out, Bob's on a roll here. Let me see it. Everybody, put your hands up. Come on. You can do it. Wonderful. For the last couple of weeks, I've looked around and I've thought, oh, there, here's a paralysis of some sort. It is a way to worship. Now, you can be sitting there and mouthing the words and have a heart that is hard as can be. Or you can say, I give you thanks, God, that you have brought me out of darkness. You have brought me out of death. You have brought me into your very presence. I worship you. I adore you. I give you thanks. I praise your name. And I surrender to you. I worship you. I lift up my hands. My lips praise you. I can't sacrifice anything else except to say, I love you, Lord. I thank you for what you've done. You guys can practice this next week, okay? Hear, O oh Lord, and be gracious to me. O oh Lord, thou art my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. This is all out of and into. It's all out of and into language. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness that my soul shall sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you. From 10 o'clock to 10.30. I will give thanks to you forever. See, if we enter his gates and his courts with praise and thanksgiving, it needs to be out of the heart. But he says, I want you to enter into this. I want you to enter in. By the way, okay, I left Zephaniah there. I'm really out of time. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you. Wait a minute. He? He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. That's you, Brandon. Brandon! I love him. This is one of my kids. With shouts of joy. Can you picture God doing that? Ah. Now here I just got done saying he was holy, righteous. And he sings, I will sing over my children. Isn't that wonderful? We should sing to him. We should sing to him out of a sprinkled conscience. Patterns. That has been our series, and I have tried to look at into and out of that whole idea of what he has brought us out of, what he wants to bring us into. I am the door, says Jesus from John 10. If anyone enters through me, he shall be safe and shall go in and out and find pasture. It's an interesting perspective. See, he wants to take us out and feed us. And we are reminded in Psalm 121, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and coming in from this time forever. Remember that. The next time you're in something and you say, Lord, get me out. He said, I'm guarding over you and I want to bring you in to what I have for you and out of what you're in now. But that's not the end because the next time I want to bring you out of that all in the idea that he is busy transforming us from glory to glory into the image of his son. Amen. 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 Thank you for that, Bob.
I, I love that you showed us the different patterns that we can find in the Bible, but I hope that this week you would take some time and see those patterns in your life. Where has God taken you out of things and where has he brought you into things? And if there's something that's on your heart that you feel like maybe I still feel like I'm in the wilderness or I'm not really sure where God has taken me and where he's bringing me next, take some time in prayer and ask God to reveal those things to you, and I'm sure that he will. So before we leave today, we do have one announcement. Uh, we have Family Sunday that's coming up. It's every fifth Sunday of the month, and what that means is that we will have our Grace Kids children up here with us, so that way we can worship as a family. So I encourage you to bring uh, your children with you and invite others to come so that way we can worship together. And then also, too, we want to invite anyone who uh, would like to have their child dedicated um, to please let us know. Um, as we saw earlier today, that is an act of worship. So if that is something that you are interested in, uh, you can make that request known using our kiosk that's in the back. So please make sure that you do that. And with that being said, I hope that you enjoy your week and that you get your kiddos from downstairs.